it's a real belief in democracy that people should be able to determine what happens in their own lives. Well, I, I feel that it was the greatest heritage my grandfather could have given us. Community organizing is, a deeply, is as deeply ingrained in the life of Chicago as deep dish pizza and barbecue ribs. <laughs> And it's been interesting to see the family dynamics. Uh, we joke about the fact that I'm one of the few trustees who's probably been told by the chairman to sit up straight in the middle of a meeting. Dear family, in compliance with the wishes of several of the members, I have now decided to give you a picture of my life. For some people, life begins at 40. Others say life begins at 80. For me, life began all over again at 90, and I have decided to relate some of the pleasures of my eventful existence. The word that we use is the Erinnerungen. The Erinnerungen. That's the recollections. We said Homa and Hopa. That is derived from the German, man sagt auf Deutsch Oma and Hopa und Opa. And that's what I'm teaching my grandchild to say. I want her to get it right. Opa, which means grandfather, is William A. Wiebold, and Oma, or grandmother, is his wife, Anna Kruger Wiebold. They left more than memories as heritage to their children and children's children. They pioneered a department store chain and a philanthropic tradition that has helped shape Chicago communities over the span of two centuries. Our goal is to educate all parents, whether they have children have lead poisoning or not. Funding neighborhood organization is really democracy in action. I call that empowerment. People can thereby take charge, take some charge over their own lives instead of having it dictated or presented to them. I feel that it was the greatest heritage our grandfather could have given us. The story of the Weebold Foundation and their family history reveals the tapestry of the American dream. William and Anna Wiebold's values and principles still guide the foundation today. Civic involvement is something that this family has had a very strong sense of, and I think for a very long time. I don't know why my great-grandparents my great had that, where that came from, except for the sense, I think, that they felt that they had done so well and given so much opportunity that they should give that to other people in return. I think of it very much in terms of uh, being taught to take a place in the community, you know, putting your feet down, planting them, looking around, and making a commitment to that community in a way that's different than a lot of people. A love for Chicago and a commitment to give the residents of her poorest neighborhoods control over their own lives are part of the Weebold family legacy. The word empowerment wasn't used, but the, it, was, it was said in different ways. They wanted people to be able to make their own plans for their own lives. William A. Wiebold thrived on making plans. A German immigrant from a poor family, he was a self-starter who, along with his wife, quickly became a successful businessman with more money than he and his family needed. My grandfather set up a foundation with, a, with the kind of money that was a lot in those days, saying he wanted to give it back to the community, and that stuck. And that's stuck for his children, and it's stuck for his grandchildren. Our goals of alleviating not just you know, conditions of misery, but, but what causes them? How do you get to the root of problems? Charity to end charity has been the phrase that, that they use, that the grandparents used. It all started from modest beginnings, a farm in Germany, and a few English lessons. I was born March 8th, 1857, in the Bauernhaus on West Ende Altenbrusch belonging to my grandfather. 
His father died when he was about three. My great-grandmother, Anna von Bergen, Weibold, married uh, Mr. Fischer, Heinrich, Heinrich Fischer, who then came and farmed there. They had to work so hard. Uh, he did go to school through about the third grade, and I love the story of his, they had to cross into the border. This was before the unification of Germany, and they had to cross into the border in the, to Hamburg um, to go to school, and the coffee in Hamburg it was much better and much cheaper than in, in Hanover, so they would bring it back, and the uh, customs office would just look the other way as they came back through, and this, they went every day, obviously. By age 10, William was hired out to a larger farm nearby, earning 50 cents a month. But there was an added advantage for hired hands. Families were privileged to gather the grains that escaped the raking after the harvest, which is the subject of the famous painting by Innes in the Paul Schulze Gallery of the Art Institute. Imagine two of the figures to be my mother and I. When he was about nine or ten, relatives, an uncle, an aunt, who lived in uh, Chicago, came, went over to visit. And um, talking with him, he realized how bright he was, and he could see that there was no future. So it was suggested that he come to the United States. I think my conclusion that he was a Franco-Prussian War draft dodger is just sort of make it a little bit more fun. Now, historically, it was fairly correct that, that he would have ended up in Bismarck's army at the tender age of 15 if he'd stayed. His uncle in Chicago sent William a ticket and advice to avoid society on the ship. But William had already set sail days before the letter arrived. Despite a difficult journey, only a few months later, young William, then 14, was enthusiastically apprenticed in the dry goods store. He wrote home about visions of his future success. Insist on the children continuing at school because what they deserve, I will surely provide someday. His second letter home was probably a welcome relief to his parents. It assured them that he had not burned in the Great Chicago Fire, October 8th and 9th, 1871. Faithful parents, we would have burned up if the wind had not been so favorable. Three-fourths of the beautiful, yes, magnificent city of Chicago burned down in less than 24 hours. It looks terrible, especially the proudest section where large buildings, such as not to be seen in Germany, were destroyed. As the embers died out and Chicago rebuilt, W.R. Weibold laid plans for his nephew's future, offering him the choice of $6 a week or an interest in the business in two years. He took the latter. I loved his comment, and one of his letters was, I am catching the bad American habit of wanting to make money. William wrote home about hard times in Chicago, but he was doing well. He joined the business, was running a store in Sheboygan, and was soon to be married to one of the clerks, Anna Kruger. She, too, emigrated from Germany as a child. After grade school, she trained to be a teacher, but had to give it up when her mother took ill. My father had the old world prejudice against women entering the business world, but he finally consented to have me become a sales girl in the V-Ball dry goods store. The proprietor was the uncle of my future husband. They were together in marriage and in business for a lifetime. They were partners in every sense. Their 50th wedding anniversary was held at the Belden Stratford Hotel. The place was full of flowers. I mean, in those days, you didn't say, don't send flowers. And it was just, so the next day, my cousins and I went to uh, uh, pick up the flowers to take to hospitals and things like that. And the two of them were arguing <laughs> about where, where this should go or that should go. We thought, oh, has this been going on for 50 years? And I remember teasing about that. It was always so apparent they, they were very mutually supportive she couldn't hear at all. He could hear very well, even until his last days. Yeah, but he had cataracts, and she was kind of his eyes uh, for any detailed need for vision, and, and he was her ears. In 1883, a week after their wedding, they opened their first store together on what is now West Grand Avenue. 
It was a Ma and Pa operation with their apartment overhead. I think Werner was born at the time they were in the 18th to Blue Island store. He was raised under one of the counters. My grandmother would uh, take the horse and buggy and go downtown and buy the makings of hats and she would be a mill and she would, she would put hats together and sell them. His concept of friendly neighborhood stores, uh, the time was ripe for that and um, I think he be became successful quite quickly. We vulture neighbor invites you over was the motto. Through long hours and hard work, the original store expanded to seven stores, each strategically located. And my grandfather's technique was to locate a, a streetcar crossing and buy up all the land around the, around the streetcar crossing and build his store and then rent or sell land to other specialty storekeepers around him. In other words, it became a little shopping center development with the key being the, stre the uh, streetcars and the key being also the people that rode streetcars, which in those days were referred to as the shawl trade versus the carriage trade, which went to Marshall Fields. The Weebolts lived comfortably, but modestly. Well, my grandfather used the the one saying that I recall him saying, he said, mit hut im hand geht man durch dem ganzen Land, which means uh, to go through life in a modest, uh, unassuming way. The, the, the direct translation doesn't mean anything. And he also used the phrase alles mit Massen, meaning everything in moderation. In the flamboyance of the Roaring Twenties, perhaps that motto influenced the Weebolts to set aside $4 million in 1921 to set up the foundation. A very simple answer. You said, well, my mother and I never seemed to make a mistake. So we decided to give it back to the people. <laughs>